I have the pleasure of introducing Sammy Kankar. He is a security researcher and a co-founder of Phonality, an IP phone system company. He is presenting today on a newly discovered series of web attacks in his presentation on How I Met Your Girlfriend. Thanks. Thanks for coming. So, as I said, I will be talking about How I Met Your Girlfriend, um, the discovery of some pretty new classes of web attacks. So, just, uh, just a quick intro. Uh, I am a security researcher. I am, you, you may have heard of me from the Sammy Worm on MySpace from a few years ago. I'm co-founder of Finality, it's an IP, voice over IP phone, phone system company. And uh, I love Lady Gaga. So some of you may be thinking, all right, yeah, you know, maybe I heard about you a couple of years ago and you know, that whole MySpace Worm thing, but you haven't really done anything since then. So what's the deal? Well, that's because they wouldn't let me touch computers. <laughs> So a few years ago, I was uh, at home and in a basically hacker style event, I was raided. My home, my office, my car, my personal belongings taken from me. My computer, laptop, iPod, cell phone, and the iPod was the worst. Um, the Secret Service came, dozens, I mean just dozens of people with guns because I'm a, I'm a pretty, uh, pretty big target. So they took all of my stuff and months and months of battling um, what, ha what had happened was I had lost computer use. So from there, obviously, I stopped using computers. <clears throat> and uh, <laughs> tweens, you know, all over the internet, disappointed. Fortunately, a few years later, I got everything removed, um, despite probation, which is kind of like AOL in real life. <laughs> but in the end, it all worked out, and I'm back, and. Uh, lucky enough to present to you guys today. So, why are we talking about the web? Well, obviously, this is a web apps sec uh, conference, but what else? You know, why do I specifically look at the web in some of my research? Well, it's really cool. I really like the web because it's something, it's basically to me, I see it as a code distribution channel. So, what does that mean? Well, virtually every computer out there has a web browser. and more and more, virtually every computer is having internet access, no matter where you go. So years ago, you know, you, there, to distribute code, it was much harder. Um, you'll remember the AOL disks. I mean, I, I have thousands of free hours from them. So you'd have to uh, distribute via mail, via floppy disk, via CD, to get someone to then run some software or run some code, if you were, whether you're doing uh, good things, bad things, malicious, doesn't matter. But today, the web lets you distribute code easily to lots and lots of people with virtually little, basically very little work. Another cool thing about the web is that we have these browsers. Everyone has a browser on their computer. And the great thing about the browser is that it can communicate in a lot of different ways. It speaks different protocols. Um, so you can, uh, you can basically talk to a lot, a lot of different protocols, do a lot of different work with them, and much more. So the web is really cool, and that's why sometimes I focus on it. So this is my homepage. Um, as usual, before I get into trouble, I'm typically just on a social network looking around at pictures of, uh, pictures of girls. So I'm going around, and I'm looking at different profiles, reading them, checking them out, and I, and I stumble upon her. It's Anna Ferris, and I think, wow, she's amazing. She's beautiful, she's smart, and she loves application security. How, how do I, I want to get to know her. So I'm about to send her a message and I say, oh wait, I better check her relationship status. Well, there's a problem. She's not single. It's not complicated. She's in a relationship. So who is this guy that she's in a relationship with? The great thing about social network is you go and you click and you find out more about that person. So who is this person? Well, I learned about, a little bit about him. A certified information security specialist professional uh, CEO of Sec Theory, co-author of XSS Exploits and various other books. He co-developed uh, the awesome clickjacking with Jeremiah Grossman. Runs hackers and slackers.org if you're familiar with those. And of course, he's a certified application security specialist. We won't go further down that route. A man who needs no introduction, Robert Arsnake Hansen. 
he is the target. So how do I attack this guy? He obviously knows about security. He knows how to protect himself. He knows how to protect his network, probably. Um, everything he's do he does is focused around security, protecting himself, making sure he's not a victim of things. So how do we do that? Well, we don't attack him. Although I want to surreptitiously ruin his relationship online, I need to figure out a way to do this. So let's not attack him. Let's attack him directly. So we look and we find that he's on Facebook. Facebook is just another one of these social networks. And let's start looking at Facebook instead. What if we were to attack Facebook or whatever other social network or web website, online service that he uses? Well, let's start taking a look at that. If you look in the URL bar, when you actually go to this website, you'll see uh, on the end, you'll see index.php. So just from that, we learn immediately that this ser server is probably running PHP. I know what you're thinking. It, it's pronounced FIP. It's not. I looked it up. It's actually PHP. So let's learn about PHP. How can we attack that? Well, what is PHP, first of all? So as many of you know, it's an extremely common web scripting language. Um, it's very easy to use. It's, it's all over the internet. Uh, most servers will have it set up by default. There are a lot of frameworks based off of it. CakePHP, Kohana, CodeIgniter. Um, it's just being used more and more every day along the lines of some of those other frameworks, uh, Ruby and, and things like that. But it's definitely the top one in use today. Now, with Facebook and most other sites, what you have when you log in is authentic uh, authentication. So you have sessions. What's a session? Well, it's basically a random string that's, that identifies you when you authorize yourself. So for example, if you were to go to Facebook and enter your credentials, your username and password, you are then given a session or a cookie. And that random string is sent to your browser, and your browser keeps that so that it can continue to send it to the server each time, uh, each time you make a request. So a session, it's just a cookie. So at this point, what would be great is if I could somehow hijack Robert's session. So normally, we might be able to do that with something like XSS. However, I know I'm dealing with someone who probably protects himself against this. Those attacks will not be easy to, uh, it will not be easy to attack him with these, with XSS, CSRF, things like that. I'm sure he's running no script, who knows what else. He probably has JavaScript turned off. There are a lot of, a lot of issues when you're trying to attack someone who understands security, who has security implemented, and that's just the way they think. So again, instead, let's look at the server. Let's look at the service that he's using. So. We'll do a quick, uh, a quick overview of how PHP sessions work. Specifically, we're going to look at the randomness, the, the random ID or identifier that you get when you log into a server. So when you're given a cookie, whether it's authentication based or not, PHP or any other language you're using generates a random string. That random string is given to you. So what I did is we, we, if we take a look at PHP, and we open up the source, and we take a look at uh, session.c, basically the code that's responsible for generating the sessions, we can actually see the code that generates that random string. So if we take a quick look, um, let's see if we have a, we have basically an IP address. The random string consists of these pieces of data. I, your IP address of the person who logged in, um, the epoch, basically seconds from 1970, microseconds, the, the number of microseconds that uh, occurred in that second when the cookie was established, uh, random LCG value, I'll go into that a little bit later. Basically, if you add all that data up, it's 160 bits. After that, it's actually checksummed. And again, you're left with 160 bits, assuming it's a SHA-1 checksum. So all right, so let's just take a, another look at that. So again, we have 160 bits of entropy. This is, normally you'd think, all right, well, why don't I just brute force this value? Well, 160 bits is a lot. And it kind of, bits are a little confusing. You think, well, 32 bits, 64 bits. Well, isn't 64 bits twice 32 bits? Well, it's not. So let's take a little, just a quick detour and, and look at bits really quickly. Um, a couple quick things, a couple cool things that you can, you can learn or, or remember, um, just some tips. For, uh, if you can remember the top 10 bits, basically 0 through 9, and know that it's 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512. And if you know that for every 10 bits you add, 
you can basically add approximately three zeros. You can really quickly determine how many values are there with that number of bits. So for example, with 10 bits, we just add the one is, uh, the, I'm sorry, the zero means one, and then it's 10 bits, so that's three zeros. So it's about 1,000. And you can do this 20 bits, 30 bits, you know, 25 bits, for example. We know five is 32, and there are 20 bits, so it's six zeros. So how big is 160 bits? Well, I calculated it. And if we had a computer that could basically calculate 100 trillion values per second, it would take 900 quadrillion eons to brute force 160 bits. I don't even know how long an eon is. I had to look it up. It's 500 million years, FYI. So I don't think I'm going to brute force this, even though I have a really fast MacBook Pro. <laughs> so again, 160 bits. I can't really brute force the, uh, the original data. I, can't also, I also can't brute force the hash data either, right? The hash basically takes your, your data and then creates uh, a pseudo-random string. And those are the same size, so it doesn't matter which one I brute force. It's not going to be beneficial to me. So let's take a quick look again. Well, some of these values we can probably figure out. Let's take a look at microseconds. Microseconds, if you recall, was 32 bits. They used 32 bits of that 160 bits to see within a second at what microsecond was that uh, cookie calculated at. But the great thing about microseconds are that there are only 100 million, or I'm sorry, uh, 100, no, there are a million microseconds within a second. But 32 bits is much more than a million. So we can actually reduce microseconds down to however many bits we need to get to a million. It will never be more than that. So immediately we can reduce 12 bits from 160 bits, which is great. So now we're down to 148 bits. Well, all right, that's, that's still a lot of data, even with my MacBook Pro. So what else can we do? What else can we reduce from these random values in order to potentially predict Robert's session ID? Well, Facebook's pretty cool. Uh, when you log into Facebook, you actually have a chat window. And what that chat window is providing is it's letting you see when people are coming online, when your friends are coming online, offline, um, when they go away. Now, that's all done via Ajax. So if you actually watch, you'll see there's a, an HTTP stream going on, and, and you see whenever you're basically making requests and seeing, is there any new data for me? Are there new people coming online or offline? Now, the cool thing about that is while this is happening, we can send a query per second, for example. As we're sending a query per second, we may see, oh, Robert just hopped online. Well, what time is it? Normally, we'd look at our local time because the epoch or local time is part of the randomness, the random, uh, the random session ID. The problem then is, well, our local time isn't that useful because we don't know the offset between our local time and the server's local time, the server actually generating the cookie. But the great thing about most web servers is they provide, they provide a date header in HTTP header. So if you see, we can actually see the very second that he logged in, and now we know the exact epoch that he had logged in. Now, um, so right there, we now know the epoch, which was 32 bits by itself. So not only did we reduce the 12 bits from the microseconds, because there are only a million microseconds per second, but we also reduced the epoch because we know the exact second according to the server time that he logged in. Pretty cool. So we're down to 116 bits. It's a lot. It's still a lot. What else do we got here? Well, what if I can get him to click a link? Not a malicious link. Just uh, let's assume he doesn't even have JavaScript enabled. If I can chat with him using this Facebook chat or whatever other social networking chat, I say, hey, check out this page. It's, it's really cool. Um, I have you know, some Farmville exploits if you want to you know, improve your own. So I give him a link. The link goes to my website. I look at the Apache, Apache access log, and I can, there I can see his IP address. Now, what if he's using a proxy? All right, well, that doesn't matter, because the proxy means he's using a web proxy. His IP address will show up as the web proxies when he, logs to, when he goes to my site, but it will also appear as that proxy address when he goes to Facebook. So I'm dealing with the same IP address, no matter whether he's using a proxy or not. So now we know his IP address, another 32 bits reduced. This is the random value that PHP uses every time it generates a cookie. If you're ever use, generating a cookie using session start or start session or cake PHP or Gohana or any of those frameworks, you're using this code. So 
So we just reduce another 32 bits. We're down 76 bits to 